welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Nat Handsome Games. The one place with a D4 that com that comes complete with a handlebar mustache. And the developers of the fairy tale adventure game known as Fabled Empire. The one and only John Gunnison. How are you doing today, man? Good, good. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, bringing me into the temple to talk about this game. Yep. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So, one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, so, I started back in 2011 with 4th edition d and I, I had some friends, uh, about 13 years ago, specifically, had some friends that uh, were like, hey, let's, let's play some Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, they were really into it, had a group, or I guess I was brought into a group, um, and I played a rogue for the first time, was definitely uh, somebody that was just just there to munchkin the entire game, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then kind of settled in, settled into the more role-playing aspects of it, the learning about the mechanics, and since then, I haven't really looked too, too much like back or away from it, uh, really been inducted into the hobby, and took a little break. For about um, a year or so, uh, just to kind of get a refresher, and and got pulled back in uh, about three years ago. So just continuing to play that, uh, well, Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition now, uh, as well as a lot of OSR games, lots of lots of games out outside of OSR, uh, things like the Year Zero engine, and uh, yeah, too too many to really really completely recall. Now, obviously, Fabled Empire is drawing upon fairy tales, so I'm curious yes. if there are any, if there are any fairy tale influ um, themed games that served as a major influence. I know in the document you had sent me, there was a short list of touchstones and inspirational materials. Yeah. But yeah. I um... didn't see TTRPGs in that. I saw video games, but not TTRPGs. Yeah, I. I didn't really find like there. There certainly are fairy tale uh, games. One of the more popular ones being Ryan Lynch's uh, Perils and Princesses. That one, um, like I've uh, uh, connected with Ryan on social media a couple times, just talking about his game and the. Because I feel like there's some parallels there, um, but where he has more of a uh, what he calls a storybook approach, um, I have. I would say that mine's more of the fairy tale fantasy, be, be that grim or uh, so, something along the lines of uh, Celtic mythology and uh, other fairy tale media. Uh, I, would, I would say I've looked at some others. There's a cipher system, uh, I guess setting, called uh, We're All Mad, as well as uh, Grim. The, the game just grim uh, and I believe that that's its own engine altogether so I've it kind is. of looked at those just for um, just as like ideas to kind of see the space and see what's in there and I didn't really find anything I think grim what one of the more off-putting parts about it is that you're kids and I didn't really want that uh, with fabled Empire I wanted the ability to to portray adults and with we're all mad it really leans into having that um having that kind of zany lewis carroll um and i didn't i, I wanted to try and have something to where it could be that kind of lighthearted uh style of play or it could have more more dark elements mm -hmm. which is fair i mean you have you have the Lighter, more, more whim, more whimsy, more storybook approach, yep. and then you, and then you have in the same vein the more 
Eastern European ap- approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a there was a Twitter challenge once ye- some years back of ruin it ruin a fairy tale in five words or less, and I said everyone dies in the German version. Oh yeah, yeah. That very I know true. Not, very I know it's not five words, but it's still true. And there's a small part, there's a small part of me that that loves that would have loved to been a fly on the wall when somebody's say a fan of the Little Mermaid and then reads the original Hans Christian Andersen story. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Or and or any or even any a number of um of fairy tales that um Disney that Golden Age Disney was drawing upon. And then you read the original version, <laughs> and I did. I did the same thing once with a f- friend of mine who had never read the original Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm. Yeah. And I, because I, because I said, well, well, if you like the movie, you should read the original. It's pretty good. Not telling him that it that the end that it's an ending that has rocks fall, everyone dies. Which he got mad at me afterwards, and I'm like, I didn't, I didn't say that it was going to. I didn't say it was going to be the same thing. I just said it was going to be a good story. Yeah, yeah. Nope. I I think that the uh, um, I I really wanted to retain some of that um, the, those darker elements, and I think although um, the the current kind of uh, how how it's marketed, I guess. Like it touches on that, but it doesn't really have that that depth that's being built as as part of the story or or I guess the 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 setting that that's available to the narrator, which is the game's uh, game or which is the game's word for game master. Uh, so all of those kind of suspicions about fairies, for instance, where you know they're they're only no good, they're um, they'll sour milk. They'll give you fairy darts. So all of that kind of Celtic mythology mm-hmm. and pulling that forward, so that you know, fairies aren't meant to be messed with. And I wanted that to be incorporated in the game. If if a um, if a narrator chose to kind of pull from those inspirations, but to also you know offer that more more lighthearted, I guess, or or the whimsy side of it, to where you could just have it be more like, well, we're off to uh, fight a dragon or this fairy, you know, wants to have a con- make a contract with the players. Mm-hmm. I've always, the way I've always described it to people is fairies do things that don't make sense. Oh, yeah. Well, don't make sense to us, but make, per- but make perfect sense to them. Yeah, I, and I think I, I heard a recent definition where it was along the lines of fairies kind of view humans as um, in, in a similar fashion to how we view animals, right? They're, they're far more um, superior, or, or at least like from their perspective, they feel that way. And so they, they only find, find us for, you know, uh, to gain enjoyment or, or fun out of. And keeping that kind of like alien mis, uh, mystery around them is uh, intentional in, in Fabled Empire. And I, I feel uh, a lot of the, the more traditional myths as well. Mm-hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, one of yeah. the... One of the first things that I did notice going through the material you had sent you had sent me is the whole notion of creating the story, and especially when it came to the playbook. So, were there any um, powered by the apocalypse games that served as inspiration? Since you're invoking the playbook motif, yeah, um, it, it could certainly be compared to uh, a PTBA game. Uh, I drew inspiration primarily from, uh, well, my entry point to the Year Zero engine was Tales from the Loop, mm-hmm. but I like the way that they construct that um, uh, that that drive. Um, I think it's drive, pride, and uh, one one other. But it, but a lot of the Year Zero engine games have these playbooks that just primarily offer. Uh, 
some kind of background that can be constructed around the the initial character that players create. And so I wanted to incorporate that in there while also providing or, or creating these playbooks that have um, ties and dilemmas that exist within fairy tale settings. Mm -hmm. That certainly makes sense. Yeah. And there were there were a few ones that that were put in the were put in the core material, but would you, but given given the fact that you, that you do have traditional attribute scores, would you say that the that um a lot of the core mechanics lean a little bit more into Year Zero's sense of risk? Uh, I I would say that it's more more of an OSR uh, approach mechanically with the with the more narrative drive of player or or I guess characters that are defined by players having more of that um, PTBA or um, year zero uh, definition. I, I just feel like especially with uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, we're going to put it out there because it's the most criticized game because it's the biggest one. But uh, things like backgrounds, for instance, you know, they give you an idea of what that character is, uh, but to provide players with, um, but to provide players with a problem that they need to solve, uh, which is essentially their dilemma that they gain from their playbook. I feel that um, it gives uh, it gives those players some kind of or, or gives them a drive to try and overcome. And they're rewarded for that. Uh, for instance, I don't recall if it was in the materials that I sent you, but uh, there's uh, like the primary uh, character advancements um, method is through resolving dilemmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I did see a bit of that. And admit, admittedly, when it comes to the the way you're hand the way you're handling using a straight d20 roll it's mm -hmm. i i'm certainly more appreciative of the fact that there's more of a baseline in in that rule of 20 that you have oh which does make me want which does make me wonder if there's um a degree of success that can that can um happen depending on how many points over 20 you get or if that's not the case yeah, it's it. Um, so mechanically speaking, it's a meter beat, um, not not something where there's a uh, target number that's defined by the game master mm -hmm. or narrator. Um, and I wanted to do that because the the narrator has the power to um, give players advantage or disadvantage, and I really didn't want it to be something where the narrator had to be creative about how somebody or or how difficult or easy something was i feel like that you, you know uh normally you'll fall on 12 and you'll say everything's everything's 12 unless i don't want you to do that and i'll pull it away from you by saying oh well this is a this is a 30 um as, as a as a games master i guess or narrator i'd pull that away from you by saying well, this is this is a challenge of thirty. You have to beat that. And instead of giving that that range, just saying, well, the player can really define the outcome of the story, and then the narrator has that control, or they have those levers, just primarily with the advantage disadvantage mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with that, with that said, of course, there's also the notion of fortune points, which. From what I'm reading here, fortune points could kind of fit the role of the extra effort mechanic that you see in a lot of games. Period. Some games, oh, yeah. will, some games will interpret it differently, but the general consensus of what I refer to as extra effort is those catch-alls of a re mechanic that you that is a limited resource that you can spend to give yourself a bit of an edge, whether it be whether it be like um, action points back in D and D fourth edition. Uh, willpower in World of Darkness, um, fortune in War in Warhammer Fantasy. It go, go goes on so f and so forth. 
Yeah, yeah. I I did want to also provide players with the ability to change the outcome of of roles. Um, uh, just in order to push their their outcome as players. So really just I'm I'm providing players with a lot of control over the outcome of narrative through um, having that that target of meter beat 20 um, on a d20 roll including your attribute score as well as the addition of fortune to to push that be that something similar to stress um, really really inspired by DM Scotty's uh, easy d6 karma uh, system he's got that um, that uh, as it, or he's got that in easy d6 certainly a core inspiration there Especially since you have kind of a rule of si a rule of six, where it's almost discouraged to pl to play very conservative with fortune points. Yeah, yeah. I saw um, originally during some of the playtests, people would hoard them and not use them. And so, uh, essentially, if the player is about to gain a seventh point, they'll roll a d4, and it will reset their maximum. Or it'll it'll reset their fortune points to whatever the outcome of that die roll is. So it's kind of a use it or lose it situation. Um, just really to to encourage uh, players to use their resources. Um, there's also abilities within the game um, that get restored after uh, long rests, which are called naps in this game. But uh, the um, I I feel like being able to provide or, or put pressure on players to use these resources is important or, or just as important because it, it's kind of the hoarding that we see in Bethesda's uh, Elder Scrolls games, right? Where you just have a, you beat the game, but you have hundreds of potions in your inventory. Yeah, I, like to yeah. Call, I like to call it the rainy day paradox. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll say that. I'll say that for a rainy day. Yeah. You'll see. Or it's all, <laughs> It, I also call it the 99 Megalixers. I yeah. can't use one of my Megalixers. What if I need it for later? He says during the final boss of the campaign. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Now, given the given the fact that this is a that this is a game that is more about an idea than a particular um, world. I'm guessing in the GM's guide, there's there you're gonna have um, multiple bits of advice on how to make a particular kind of archetype more not archetype more um, story arc more one that carries a fairy tale feel. Yeah, there there will be a lot of resources, um, and I've I've written the a portion of them at this point. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm on Kickstarter is to actually continue to to just fund this project mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially with the with the art the art, art art is so expensive if you want to pay artists fairly mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah um, the the narrator side of it is going to be pretty resource heavy with a bestiary um, I plan to define some factions that are really up to the narrator's discretion to include or exclude. So just a lot of ideas that plant them into a, a loose fairy tale setting. Um, I think that uh, fairy, fairy tales uh, also, I, I, had, I had a play test where there was a player that came, came on board pretty early on in the play testing phase, and they were viewing it more of the Feywild, where it was a place that you went to um, uh, and just to kind of <laughs> touch on that a little bit, uh, this is one of those, this is primarily a setting where it's, uh, it's commonly referred to as the Kingdom Entire, where all events, characters, all belong to this realm or this place. There's no, like, uh, it, it's not a portal into a wild, for instance. So there, there's a lot of, um, there is going to be some setting pieces that narrators can choose to pull in, uh, as, as well as a lot of advice on how to structure just settings and campaigns. Mm -hmm. 
Now, do you plan on having a um my a mic like a micro one shot adventure or short campaign within the full book? Uh yeah, yeah. I I do plan on having that. The uh and the play test as well that will uh come out with the uh with the conclusion of the Kickstarter. Uh so this will go out to all backers will include a one shot campaign so that the you can play it um and provide feedback. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Uh, right now, I have it at 300. Uh, it could be 320. could be the maximum. Um, and, and then there's... Um, I, I did want to also include a second like book or PDF that could be provided to players that's not as intimidating. Because mm -hmm. I feel like whenever you hand a, hand a large tome to a player and say, oh yeah, learn it. It'll be easy. It's only 320 pages. Really, really what a game master is saying is, oh, just read like the first you know, 50... 50 to 100 pages. Uh, so I want to provide a, a separate book PDF that uh, that just has the player specific details. Kind of like as well. the player, kind of the like the player's guide books that um, Cipher does, especially with Numenera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, I, I believe uh, Shadow Dark has has them as well, just like little pamphlets that you can you can get. And cheat sheets are nothing new. In, R in RPGs as well. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, I've already got that on lock. Um, it, it's been super helpful with playtests specifically, just having all of these like resources so that uh, folks aren't like sh uh, sorting through pages. Yeah, th it's for that reason that it's always very important to be have not have navigation. I've seen some books that skimp on net on navigation where you'd have oh, like yeah. a 200 yeah. page book with no um bookmarks yeah yeah um yeah I certainly plan to have it all interactive once that uh once all of the chapters are defined or sections um i i'm i'm actually just a brief shout out i'm actually very impressed with the interactive pdf that flabbergasted has um if you're familiar with that game at all uh, yeah, they, they just did like a, a whole different UI for it. Um, and it's really fun because it's just, it, it's more of a, it's, it's more of a, a website looking PDF than it is a, uh, uh, than it is just like an interactive, uh, uh, what I guess, table of contents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. And with now, with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a potential release window? Not a date per se, but kind of a ballpark you're shooting for. Yeah. So I, at the moment, I'm being very generous, uh, just just because I, I wanted to include space for if stretch goals were met uh, to to add additional art. But December or January of next year for digital and then January or February of next year for uh, physical fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that's just, yeah, get the final draft. Like digital is so, so convenient, but um, the physical of course, like has to be printed and shipped and all that, all the, all those fun logistics that you don't want to think about when you're running a Kickstarter campaign, but are a necessity, especially with physical goods. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the devil is in the details. Oh, yeah. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's uh, It's been good. I, I appreciate, you know, you, you taking the time to, to talk about the game mm -hmm. on it, within the temple and bring it to your audience. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pop another one then. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule 
to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!